you know, in a sense, all journalism is local, yeah. right? Every journalism Absolutely. starts in a place. Mm -hmm. And uh, the power of local journalism is that if communities can recognize themselves and their neighbors uh, in the storytelling, if they can identify issues that affect them, often those are, are issues that affect everyone, especially in polarized uh, societies. And, you know, the U.S. is just as much a, a polarized and conflictual society as many of the places that we more traditionally think of that way. That was Nick Dawes, executive director of The City, a nonprofit newsroom covering local stories in New York. This is a dispatch episode from the International Journalism Festival in Perugia, Italy. When we were in Perugia, we bumped into a lot of past, present and maybe future colleagues, including Nick Dawes. We stopped him in the middle of the street to ask him about his work at the city and the role of local journalism in New York City and beyond. Here's what he had to say. If you look at New York, you think it's the media capital of the world, right? There are these huge legacy news organizations uh, like the New York Times. There are, of course, many um, television stations and broadcast companies. There are digital startups. But almost all of them have their eyes fixed on the horizon of the whole country or the world. And what's happened is that all the coverage that used to be there of New York, um, done by the local tabloids, even by big papers, by TV and, and radio to some extent, has kind of withered away and been hollowed out. So you don't have reporters anymore sitting in courthouses, yeah. sitting in City Hall, going into New York's neighborhoods, especially the neighborhoods that are less white, less rich than Lower Manhattan. You know, people still write about Lower Manhattan because yeah. it's a a place where people with resources and power live and that they care about. So uh, we created the city in order to both fill that gap that's been left by the retreat of uh, traditional newspapers yeah. and to try and do it a little differently, uh, to, to bring a view from the neighborhoods, uh, a view from less affluent and more marginalized communities and to do accountability journalism around that, uh, to do explanatory journalism and provide solutions, uh, and to start to rebuild that civic information infrastructure that a great city needs. Do you think the transition to digital contributed to the erosion of local journalism in New York City? There are many reasons, I think, why local news has been eroded. And of course, the easy excuse is, you know, the ad revenue went away, especially local ad revenue went to social platforms and search platforms. Um, but it's also true that there's been tremendous consolidation in print and mm -hmm. especially local newspapers have been bought up by hedge funds and other investors whose basic plan is to rip out the assets and you know, milk them as much as they can, degrade the journalism. So you have these companies that are almost like zombie news companies uh, owned by hedge funds, owned by large investors and uh, they haven't invested at all uh, in reaching audiences on digital platforms and frankly they don't care about it. So. So there's a dimension um, of, of it that is due to the technology change and revenue changes and a dimension that is um, more cynical and less easily uh, put down to external forces. How does local news set the stage for global narratives? You know, in a sense, all journalism is local, yeah. right? Every journalism Absolutely. starts in a place. Mm -hmm. And uh, the power of local journalism is that if communities can recognize themselves and their neighbors uh, in the storytelling, if they can identify issues that affect them. Often those are, are issues that affect everyone, especially in polarized uh, societies. And, you know, the U.S. is just as much a, a polarized and conflictual society as many of the places that we more traditionally think of that way. So, um, you know, the big national stories play out at local level, for sure, and the trends that we're seeing nationally. Um, but also it's possible to convene conversations and drive accountability at a local level uh, in a way that's a lot more effective often uh, than national storytelling. But I mean, I can think of a few examples. Climate change. Mm -hmm. Most people in the world are going to experience the worst impacts of climate change in an urban setting. Now. So, uh, for example, in New York, we've in experienced increasingly intense bursts of rain uh, that the city is not built for. So we've seen people's um, particularly poor and immigrant uh, neighborhoods where many people have had to find accommodation in converted basement apartments, often illegally converted. Uh, during Hurricane Ida, when we got a big rainstorm sweeping through New York, those apartments flooded. Yeah. More people died in New York City than died in the South where the hurricane really hit. So that story of climate change, the way it's playing out, 
and the way it's affecting the most vulnerable people uh, the most profoundly is an urban story, a city story, a local yeah. story. So finding those connections uh, and amplifying them, treating them with the seriousness and the quality of journalism that a national news outlet would do, um, not treating local journalism as a second class thing that you graduate from. Um, th those are some of the sorts of things uh, that you can do to both tackle national and global themes uh, and drive a, a real civic conversation where you are. What role do independent journalists, columnists, or people who don't work in the traditional newsroom setting have to play in local reporting? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are there's, I think there's a range of different ways in, in which that plays out. So, I mean, we have, uh, I've noticed a, a young woman on TikTok who picks up our stuff mm -hmm. uh, and breaks it down in a TikTok way on her own, yeah. adds her own stuff um, and her own perspective and distributes it to an audience of young, policy engaged, but not wealthy and not um, media connected people. And so she does, she's doing a mix of repurposing and distribution and community engagement without ever talking to us. She never told us, hey, you know, um, can I use your stuff? Yeah. Uh, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, so you see that kind of thing. Um, you see uh, people who have almost like a Instagram show that they've created, uh, you know, using reels, uh, telling stories from the neighborhood. I don't think even our organization is very good at tapping into that energy uh, yet, but we have done things. We've created a lot of collaborative journalism projects where we collaborate with communities. We created an obituary uh, project for COVID-19. Obituaries are deeply unequal. Yeah. Um, wealthy people get obituaries in the paper, famous yeah. people, white people. Yeah. Most of the people who died um, in the pandemic were neither wealthy nor white nor famous. Yeah. Um, so we created a platform for people to share stories of loved ones that they lost. We created a network of volunteers to research and write their obituaries um, to form a huge digital memorial. Um, we worked with a library, um, the Brooklyn Public Library, to have uh, commemorative events that thousands of people attended. Yeah. A theatre group came to us and said, "Can we make a play?" Yeah. Um, so you know, there are, these are all things. Okay, there's a tradition, there's a new but traditional media organisation involved, but we're working with journalism adjacent um, information infrastructure, civic conversation uh, players. A lot of national and international publications rely on local journalists to get their story ideas. Do you see that as a good thing or is it a challenge that you face? So our stories are constantly picked up um, and they're picked up in a couple of different ways. One, we give them away. Please publish our story. We would like you to include our tracking pixel so mm -hmm. we know that it appeared somewhere and we ask you to do that and we put the code in the story and we would love community papers, uh, big papers, um, other outlets to do that. Then we would like people to follow our reporting you know, and um, we really appreciate it when they mention us. <laughs> um, and uh, oftentimes they don't and that frustrates us and we complain because the links back matter to us. They show us that we um, had, a, had an impact. That's important for us both to track our, our effectiveness. It's important to our funders. Um, we would like, but if they don't, it's also kind of okay because what we want to do is achieve an outcome. We want a more equitable, better city for New Yorkers with a healthy, robust information environment. Um, and if that means other people steal our stories, which I promise you happens every day, you know, we can, we can live with that as well. Um, and the same happens when national and global news organizations want to come and hire our journalists. Yeah. We, we want, and one of the things that I find most inspiring about our team is that so many of them have told me they're not looking to graduate to the New York Times or the BBC uh, or, or even Vox Media, they want to work in local news. Yeah. Um, so that's a vocation that is inspiring to me and it clearly drives our people. But we've had people who've been hired into really good, really impactful jobs at big uh, news outlets and that's great too. To, to rebuild a healthy journalism ecosystem, you have to have different pathways in mm -hmm. and one of the roles we play is we take lots of younger reporters particularly from the public university system uh, from CUNY uh, the City University of New York which is probably the greatest engine of economic mobility anywhere in America uh, and if those kids get noticed working for us and yeah. make their way into um, elite media institutions and start to change them that's a huge win for our model and we're fine with that. Do you think a lot of journalists would choose city or metro reporting because of the stories that they get to tell? 
I think if they have a good work environment, yeah. uh, if you know if it's treated as um, desirable quality work, and the incredible thing about metro journalism is the impact you can have. Yeah. And traditionally, as journalists, we like to pretend that we don't care about impact, that we just tell the story. But suddenly, when it comes to the time for the award ceremony, we're all writing <laughs> the impact down, right? And that's the secret truth, is that we all want impact. And so the incredibly empowering thing about doing metro journalism is the officials look you in the eye every day. Yeah. And they look the communities that you serve in the eye every mm -hmm. day. Yeah. And so the response that you get, the speed of the response, is extraordinary. And the impact we've been able to have on everything from the rollout of vaccines yeah. to um, the disbarring from city government of uh, corrupt officials, even to small things. We got a suicide hotline installed on the Triborough Bridge, which oh, yeah, hadn't been yeah. there for, for 20 years. So that's incredibly rewarding for reporters. And I think people who do it see it and, and they love it. And they also come to love the connection you have with the community. I know, having done national and international news, as well as local news, that you often deal with a very small uh, group of people mm -hmm. and a very insular elite. Yeah. Um, and the opportunity to engage daily um, with a much wider uh, audience and a much wider community of sources that doesn't just represent a tiny little insular circle is incredibly, incredibly professionally satisfying.